We're coming to the end of this uh, consideration of come and see. We told you that you can, you can break down Jesus' uh, disciple-making ministry in four phases. Come and see, come and follow me, come and be with me, and then remain in me, abide in me. And uh, this is the last time we're going to look at the come and see phase. And we're going to try to do some, some bridging tonight toward the come and follow me. But <clears throat> the last time we looked at his encounter with Nicodemus, remember? <clears throat> Came to him at night. Wanted to uh, speak a kind word about him. And Jesus just cut to the chase. Pressed him on some matters, and then when Nicodemus began to ask questions, which were inevitable based on what Jesus was, was teaching, Jesus said, you're the, you're the teachers. And that always strikes me. He used a definite article. He didn't say you're one of Israel's teachers. You're one of Israel's rabbis. You, you are the teacher in Israel. And we told you, uh, we looked at the end, and, and the end of the story for him is so encouraging because he came to Jesus at night, but it's, it's in the middle, it's in, it's, it's in the middle of day when he, when he boldly goes to the authorities and says, I want the body of Jesus. Let me take him down. What a difference. But you know what? That happens to any, any disciple. It happens. Timidity is inevitably overcome by boldness if, if, if a religious culture does stifle that. And that's, a, that's the challenge, I think. Well, tonight we're going to look at Jesus reaching out to the, to the outcast, to the forgotten, to the, to the down and out. As I said earlier, to, really to, to someone, if Jesus had said to the disciples, you go find somebody and bring them back to me for us to talk to them about this mission. I don't think this woman or any woman like her would have been on any, any of their lists. I'll tell you why in a little more. Let's just, let's just read through this real quickly. And it's 42 verses. But I want you to hear the flow of it. And then we're going to go back and, and, and learn some things from it. Uh, now when Jesus learned, this is John chapter 4 verse 1, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. No, folks, if you look on the map, no, he did not have to pass through Samaria. That, he didn't have to go geographically through Samaria. He didn't have to go even, even in terms of the, of the Via Romana, the Roman road structure. It, that was... So hold on to that. He had to go through Samaria. And what we need to pray for as we pray for a holy boldness is that God will put upon us that have to. So he came down to, to, Samaria, to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, because even though he was fully God, he was fully man, and he would get thirsty, and he would get tired, and he would get hungry. He was sitting beside the well, about the sixth hour of the day, middle of the day. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. You've, if you've studied this passage at all, you know it's very unusual for a woman to come in the middle of the day to draw water. They would come normally as the sun was going down or try to get there early in the morning. Uh, you wouldn't come in the heat of the day to draw water unless. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew... Ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. For Jews, John, this is John's commentary, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. Now he's, he's talking about himself here. And he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. And the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Now she's kind of mocking him here. Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. 
Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. It's hard to know if she's being sincere at that point or not. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place, it's mean you Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And then this had to just blow her away. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, parenthetically, there, there are liberals who say that Jesus never claimed to be Messiah. You, you've got to rip John chapter 4 out of your Bibles or decide that it was, it was a false portion of Scripture not worthy of being considered to, to assert that. She's just talked about Messiah, the Christ. I who speak to you am he. Well, just then the disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. We, obviously some of the conversation is not here. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. And meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has, some, has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. We'll look at that teaching here in a few minutes. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. That's what she went back to tell. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And then they said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. That, folks, the only other place in the New Testament I know of where anything like this happens is when the Gadarene demoniac is completely delivered by Jesus and he wants to go with Jesus. Mark chapter 5, we've studied it on Sunday morning. And Jesus says, no, you go back to your own people. Tell them what's happened, what the Lord's done. And he goes back. And the next time the scripture records Jesus coming through Gadara, because remember, remember what happened then when he had delivered this man from the demons and cast the demons into the pigs, the businessmen, the, the pig owners, and, the, and the, approached him and said, you need to leave this area. We, <laughs> they didn't say this, but you're not good for business. I mean, basically what they were telling him. This is, this is disastrous for us. You need to go. The next time he comes back through that same area, Decapolis, crowds throng out to meet him. And it's not because they talk to the pig owners. It's because they talk to the fellow who formerly known as the Gadarene demoniac. That's only the place in the New Testament. I know that something like this happens in the gospel accounts. This woman goes back to town and says, you've got to come meet this man. Now, let's get a little background here. What's, what's going on? 
In the time of Moses, if you remember, God commanded the people of Israel not to intermarry with those outside the Jewish community. There was, there was to be a, a relative ethnic purity to keep the people, one identifiable people, in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah out of the Jews. Well, you can imagine how difficult it was to accomplish that. I mean, these people were overrun uh, by the, by the uh, Assyrian Empire in 722 B.C. And, uh, and there was forced intermarriage in some of them. And so out of this grew a people called the Samaritans. And the Jews hated them as much or more than they hated the Gentiles because they saw them as half-breeds. We refer to them as Samaritan dogs. No self-respecting Jew would be caught in the presence of a Samaritan man certainly not a Samaritan woman. And what you're going to see here is that Jesus shows his disciples and will show us too that he cares for those that no one else cares for. In fact, he cares for those that people hate and despise. Someone has contrasted the Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. Listen to this. So she was all Nicodemus was not. He was a Jew, she was a Samaritan. He was a man, she was a woman. He was learned, she was ignorant. He was morally upright, she was sinful. He was wealthy and from the upper class of society, she was poor and probably almost an outcast, which I think will explain why she went to get the water the time she did. He recognized Jesus' merits and sought him out. She saw Jesus only as a curious traveler and was quite indifferent to him initially. Nicodemus was serious and dignified. She was flippant and possibly... Uh, Sarcastic. What a laboratory of learning this was for the disciples. They could understand him engaging Nicodemus. Well, Nicodemus came to him, of course. I, mean, I told you the last time we looked at this a couple of Sunday nights ago that, that when Nicodemus came, they, they had their hopes pinned on this. This was... <laughs> That he was going to make inroads with the Jewish elite. When you go back and look at the dialogue, it didn't go at all like they'd hoped it would go. In fact, it never did, really, when he met the Pharisees, with the Pharisees. And then they come upon this. And in this case, Jesus is the one who started the conversation. He was responding to Nicodemus' comments. And so let's think through this together for just a few minutes. This fascinates me. He had to go through Samaria. He, he is compelled. Now Jesus knows all things. He knew this woman was going to be there. And he had to encounter her. He had to encounter her because he is such a compassionate Savior. But he also had to encounter her because his disciples needed to see that Jesus was completely breaking with Jewish tradition. There would be no such thinking in Jesus' mind nor teaching to them that the Samaritans have their own religious expressions. Let them work that enough. So there he is. He sits at Jacob's well outside of Sychar. The woman comes to draw water in the sixth hour, the middle of the day. I think commentators are right when they say that she came alone because she was not received by the other women. If you know anything, if you've ever read anything about Jewish customs uh, and practices, you know, every, nearly everything was, a, uh, was an event for them. The women would go to the well together. They would, it, would, it was like a social event. And they would get their water pitchers and go at the same time, and they would talk about this, that, and the other, and talk about what's going on in the house. They would get their water filled. Did the same thing when they washed their clothes. I mean, they just did things together. They were very driven by community.
And there she was by herself. The Samaritans were the same way. Nobody wanted to be around her. Perhaps when she went with, the, with her, her peers, uh, the, the fellow Samaritans, maybe they didn't even talk to her. Maybe they ignored her. You've seen it happen, I know. It's pitiful when it happens. Somebody who's, who's not a part of the clique or the group, they try to inject themselves in it and it's like, eh, who are you? Look at her. And you can only feel that and take that so many times before you just, you just give up and you, you retreat, you withdraw. And here she is. She's by herself. She sees Jesus sitting there, but she, she can't avoid it. She's already there. She's going to get water. And she's not going to do it at another time. It's too, too risky, too, too challenging. So she goes to draw water and he engages her. And that is, as I said, no self-respecting Jew would be caught in the presence of a Samaritan. And yet Jesus speaks to her. Give me something to drink. Think about the implications of that. Can I be totally honest with you for a minute? When I grew up in Beaumont, Texas, I grew up in a very prejudiced culture. We were really hypocritical about it too. Two black women, a mother and a daughter, I told you about them before, would keep us when my mom and dad would go on some of these trips that he won through his sales uh, expertise. And they would come to our home and stay with us and they would, they would bathe us and they would feed us and they would spank us. And okay. But for all that, we were very prejudiced. We uh, said awful things about black people. And I took a job at a uh, florist shop that was owned by one of Karen's relatives and I was what they called a hopper. I, would, I was the guy that got on the big truck, the big panel truck, and I would we'd pull up to an address. I would get off and take the flowers and take them to the door and the driver was a black young lady Bobby what's her name and I was very uncomfortable about that I didn't want any of my friends to know that I was well you know this went on like in a for a summer toward the end of the summer one day Bobby didn't have her lunch she said I'm gonna go to mama's to eat you wanna go with me I mean I was on the truck what were my options, realistically? I said, sure. So we went in the house. I'm totally uncomfortable. Her mama's fixing hamburgers. She fixes me a hamburger. I'm ashamed to say it. I, now, folks, I had probably eaten at places where there were black cooks in the back. But I mean, I was... I was just so put off by that. Now, fast forward, it was the best hamburger I ever had in my life when I, when I ate it, but, but, but leading up to that, that was just traumatic for me. And I thought, what's going to happen when people know that I, I ate in a black person's house? Black person's food cooked in a black person's kitchen with black people's kitchen stuff. I mean, I was, I, was, I was shook up about this for a while. Okay, why don't I tell you that? The last thing this woman expected Jesus to say was to give me something to drink. She, she could not even, it was not even in her, her world view her, that, that he would want her to touch a dispenser and dip water and serve it to him to drink. But in her mindset, this Jewish man would think that that from beginning to end is totally contaminated. In fact, I've told you that for the, for the real strict uh, Jewish the rabbis, the upper class, if they were on the way to synagogue to worship, and a Gentile or a Samaritan walked by and the shadow of that person was cast over them, if they're walking and they saw that person and they couldn't get out of the way quick enough and they looked and the shadow was over here, they turned around and go back home. Because they were defiled. They, they could not go into synagogue like that. They had to go through some ritual purification to get to deal with this. Jesus, Jesus shows this woman value when he speaks to her. Shocked her, I know. But look what he's doing. He's valuing her. I want you to give me something. He's not commanding her here. It's, it, you give me something to drink. Well, she says... 
I mean, she just speaks what's on her mind. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? I don't understand. How could you do that? Why would you do that? And Jesus answered. Now look what he's, what he's doing here. If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Again, I'm telling you, there's, there's, not, a, there's not a possibility that she would ever think to ask a Jewish man to give her water. She's there alone, middle of the day. There's, The only way a man would do that is if he, if he didn't know her. And, and then he knows where she is. He knows where she's from. She's a Samaritan woman. He's a Jew. But Jesus says, if you knew who was asking you this, you'd ask me. Well, now this is where I think she gets a little sarcastic. She says, sir, you, you don't have anything to draw water with. And the well's deep. Where are you going to get that living water? Now she took his words initially to mean just life-giving water, that when you're thirsty, uh, water provokes life. I, I read the other day, trying to think through better health practices, that, that by the time you are thirsty, that you recognize that you're thirsty, you're dehydrated already. She says, are you greater than our father Jacob? So what, what are you... What are you purporting to be here? He gave us the well and drank from himself as did his sons and his livestock. And then Jesus says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Well, she understood that. She's coming back to the, she comes back to the well, back to the well, back to the well. It, you, you, you quench your thirst, but you're always thirsty again if you're drinking water that, that perishes. If you're eating food that perishes, you're going to be hungry again. But whoever drinks, as verse 14, of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. He's, he's met this woman at the point of a need and talked about how he can meet a deeper need. The water that I will give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What's, he, he's, he's spoken to her about hope. These images of water. See, water for these people was life. Cut off water, you cut off their life. The water that I offer will well up in a person as a spring. Now, they understood spring. The spring would, would bubble up. It would, it's, it's the purest of water that they had available to them. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. I want you to know what's a couple of things have happened here. Jesus, in that brief encounter, has torn down her barriers. She would not have normally ever conversed with him that way. Now she is saying to him, give me, give me this. I want what you have to offer. She's not thinking about, you're a Jewish man, I'm a Samaritan woman, this isn't appropriate, somebody's going to find out, I'm going to get in really big trouble. About no, no, he has, he has bridged the gap for her. By his willingness to meet her where she is and to value her when no one in her life does that to her. She says, give me this so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Now, if you, if you follow what's going on here, she's become somewhat vulnerable to him in this exchange. And then he does something that, that at, first, at first glance we don't know what's going on but you see in that culture it would be much more appropriate to speak to a woman with her husband present now we know that he, he knows exactly her circumstance but what he's appealed to here is go get your husband we, we want I want good decorum here on you that's what she's hearing go call your husband and come here bring your husband back with you and we, we'll talk more she said, I don't have a husband. Jesus again knows. But folks, we can, we can, if we learn to be good listeners, we can find out a lot 
of what Jesus simply knew supernaturally. Jesus said, you're right, saying I have no husband. Now you've spoken the truth here. For you've had five husbands. Now, now he is probing. And the one you now have is not your husband. You've spoken the truth when you said, I don't have a husband. But I mean, this is so amazing to me. He, he does not slander her, defame her. He simply says, I, I know you. I know your past. And I know your present circumstances. Now folks, I think when he said that, that she felt condemned. She, but Jesus did not condemn her in what he said. You say, well, he told her she had, she'd had five husbands. Yeah, he was, he was telling her he knew about her marital relational journey, and it had not been good. In fact, it had been so bad that she'd finally given up marrying men and was simply living with a man now who was not her husband. Now, it's interesting. She, she is, I think, feeling shame but she does not feel accused by him. Now, folks, we need to learn to do that. I, I, think, I think too often it's too easy for us to condemn, to, uh, to rail against, to revile, to ridicule, and to rebuke. And Jesus simply, simply points out her circumstances. It would be like talking with somebody and they say, well, and, and let's just happen. This has happened to me more and more and it happens increasingly. Well, no, I'm, I'm not married, but I'm living with a fellow. We, when we would go door to door doing our faith evangelism training, you know, years ago, I can't tell you how many times I happened upon that in homes in Owasso. Now, at that point, I could revert to the, we were talking earlier today in our pastoral ministry team to my, to my legalistic upbringing. What? You whore, you slut, you immoral woman. What I was learning to do was go without, without looking like they shocked me to go, really? What's his name? Not at all condoning that, because Jesus isn't condoning this here. He has simply pointed out what is true. And he, and, and he has gotten her so vulnerable she tries to, to she, she's going to dodge the issue a little bit here. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. In other words, you, you just told me about myself and we just now met. So, so there's got to be something, you have something of, of the divinity of God driving you. I perceive that you're a prophet. And I've always been wanting to ask a prophet this. So she's, she totally runs in a different direction with the conversation. And Jesus shows her, he's not, I'm not having any of it. We're not going to debate which mountain were to worship Messiah on. Well, I mean, he knew. He even at one point says, you know, we worship what we know and you worship what you do not know uh, for salvations of the Jews. But that's, he's not, he's not going to debate this woman. He's not going to let her run down a rabbit trail. He's not going to get caught up in something where they will magnify their differences. And he talks about, rather than, rather than thinking of worship as a location, think of worship as an activity due to God, and that God is seeking worshipers. You see, he is, he is setting up to reveal himself to her as Messiah. God seeks worshipers who worship him spiritually, that is, from their spirit, not from tradition, not from, not from what they've always been told, but first of all, spiritually, and spiritually driven by truth. So, so honestly, spiritually and honestly, the Father is seeking such worshipers. God is spirit, so you, by, by saying that, he's saying you can't, you can't locate God to a mountain. You can't uh, relegate him to a right place and a wrong place. Worship is from the heart. It's a matter of the heart. Then the woman says to him in verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming and, and that uh, who's the one who's called Christos, the anointed one, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. I, I, I know that he's coming. It's, 
recognize you as a prophet. And I know that, that some of these things I want to know are going to be settled when Messiah comes. And I promise you, she was not ready for what happens next. I who speak to you am he. Put yourself there. What did I just hear? I, I, I know Messiah's coming. This fellow just said to me that Messiah has come, that he is the Messiah. And, and I think she's, she's going over. And here come the disciples. They come back in from, their, from going grocery shopping. And uh, this is what they walk in on. Now put yourself with them for a minute. <laughs> they, they think they're figuring Jesus out. But again, there was no way they would be prepared to find Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman. If word got back to just the Jewish community about this, the likelihood of him being recognized as a rabbi would be just up in smoke. They marveled again that he was talking with a woman. And here's what they must have thought this. No one dared speak it. What do you seek? What, what is it you're after? What, what is the point of talking with her? What, is to, what good is to be accomplished there? Talking with Nicodemus they could understand. If you could get a foothold in with Nicodemus, you might could get access to the Sanhedrin, some things, some things that really happen in a positive way. But what in the what good can come from this? And so they're a distracting force at this point when they come back and they walk in upon this scene. And, and I, I think you can use a little sanctified imagination and imagine the looks on their faces which spoke volumes. Like what is going on? Well, she leaves. In fact. She leaves her water jar. I mean, she came there to get water. She came there alone because probably no one would associate. Something has changed this woman radically. She leaves her water jar. She goes into town and begins to speak to the people. Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Now I want you to get, get, in, get down into this for a minute. Folks, this woman has no credibility with this community. What Jesus said about her, basically everyone in that community knows, and it explains in large part why no woman would want to be caught dead with her, much less join her in going to get water. And she doesn't care about what people think about her anymore. And she, she makes this appeal in, in apparently such a compelling way and ask them she says, she says I just met a man that's told me everything I've ever done now now I have to just withstand the carnal curiosity here to, what else did Jesus tell her about herself but he told her enough that she, she concludes this man knows everything I've ever done he knows in a way that no one that I know can know. Can this be the Christ? <laughs> do, do you think I just stumbled upon the Messiah? Now, we, can't, we really cannot appreciate even the way that's written down here. But here's a woman who has no credibility with the people, who, who has a reputation that would make them want to run from her. And her appeal is so compelling that they leave, the t they go out of the town and begin coming out to where he is. Now, I heard an African American preacher say one time, he said, if Christians would catch on fire, crowds would gather just to watch them burn. There's something that happens when we have a compelling desire to tell people what great things the Lord has done. Just stop there a minute and think. What would you say to people about, about what Christ has done for you? The best person that's ever been saved would, would have to say something like, you know, I thought I was a good person and I encountered Jesus and gosh, I became aware of my sin and, 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 and was exposed in my sin and 
And yet he, he cleansed me. He made me new. And now, now I know that any goodness I have, any righteousness I have is from him. He delivered me from my false sense of goodness. I mean, think about what other, what other things you say going back from that. I was telling the men this afternoon, oh, Karen and I went to a, a Gideon's Pastors Appreciation Banquet. It's the, it's the first one I've ever been able to attend in terms of scheduling. What a blessing it was in so many ways. But one of the fellows that shared her testimony was a pastor who, when he was in high school, was basically left all alone. His mom was a drug addict and she was dying. He began to get into drugs and someone gave him, they passed out a Gideon New Testament in high, at the high school kids. And he took it and took it home, tossed it on the shelf and his life just kept spiraling downward more and more. He, he got into drugs, he began dealing drugs and, and he came to the point where he was suicidal. And he remembered that book and he, he took it off his shelf, still had it there. He said it surprised him that he still even had it sitting there. He began to read it. And the Lord saved him in reading through there. And so he thought, man, I need to get around people that believe this. So he went to a church and he said, and he got to understand, he said, I had, I had hair down to the middle of my back. I had tattoos. I had rings all over my, my face and ears and nose and and he said, my, my pants were hanging way down. And I went in there and stood there. And I looked around. And he said, I didn't see anybody in there that looked like me. He said, I was, felt really out of place. And, and uh, so the service was over. He said, the preacher was just really spoke right to me. And so the lady came up to me. He said, I learned later she was 72 years old. And she came up and she said, we're so glad to have you here. I sure hope you come back. He said, nobody in my whole life Nobody had ever invited me to church. He said, I went back. And I kept going back. And finally I understood what the Lord had done. He had saved me. And this fellow is a pastor today. And what a, what a powerful, what a powerful, just this woman was simply being faithful. I'm so glad you're here. Come and see. Come see again. I hope you come back. Jesus' encounter with this woman has given her a compelling... A, a, she cannot help. This is... When the, when, the, when the apostles were threatened with beatings, if you don't stop preaching in this man's name, we're going to beat you. We, do what you will, but we cannot help but share with you what we've seen and heard. Well, now, back at, the, back at where Jesus and the disciples are, they went grocery shopping, remember? So they've come back and said, Rabbi, you need to eat. It's time to eat. It's funny. You need to, you need to, you know, we went and got your food. You need to eat. I don't know what you were doing over here with this lady, but you, it's, you need to eat. We did this for you. We're taking care of you. And Jesus says to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Now food is for nourishment. Food strengthens you. Physically speaking, biologically speaking, you go without food uh, for several days, enough days, and you will, you will begin to go, your, your body will begin to break down. But when he says this, I have food to eat that you don't know about, he's, he's saying, I am nourished in a way that you don't begin to know. The disciples said to him, did someone, did someone else bring him something to eat? Did, he, did someone feed him already? We went to get him food. What's, who fed him? Who would have done that? It's our job to feed him. We, we take care of Jesus. Nobody else does that. And then he makes it plain. My food... And this is what I'm going to ask you. What, what is your food? What's, what's my food? My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. We know that eating good food nourishes you. Here's the question. Are we nourished? Can we say, I, Pastor, I get so nourished when I minister to someone in Jesus' name, when I, when I get to share with someone about Jesus. That, in fact, it is, it is exhilarating. It is, it is beyond 
the thrill of a meal. It's, it's, it's better than Pat's banana pudding. I mean, it's just, it is so enriching and so delighting. See, that's what struck me when I was going through this. Can I say that? That I am strengthened when I do the will of Him who sent me. It's not, no one has to force that down my throat. No one has to, to shove that, to gag me with that. No one has to, to berate me and coax me and cajole me. Can, can I say that, that there is a delight I find in doing the will of God that, is, that I can only liken to the nourishment of a sumptuous meal. In fact, it is better than that because it sustains me. It exhilarates me. It strengthens me. And then he describes about the whole process of sowing and reaping and how, how we should see that, you know, and here's the thing. Most places we will go, I mean, unless we, unless we go off in somewhere in Papua New Guinea where they haven't been there yet, most places we will go, somebody's already been with the gospel. And we get to come in behind them, do some more sowing to be sure, do, do some watering, and do some reaping. We get, to, we get to have, and Jesus says, you get to have the benefit. I sent you to reap for that, verse 38, which you did not labor. And others have labored and you've entered into their labor. Well, the, the passage ends with the Samaritans believing the report of the woman. Now, think about this. These people would not have given her the time of day. And yet so compelling. That's the only word I know to come up with. She, she's changed. I don't know, was it her countenance? Do you remember, do you remember when you last met a brand new believer? I'm talking about before, before religion could get to them and kind of sort them out, but when you just met a brand new believer, you remember that? Any of you remember that? There is a light in the eyes. There is a fascination. I remember, I watched, I watched the transformation of a young lady in my office one time come from darkness to light. And she, she had a hunger on her in her life that really offended her boyfriend. She was so changed. Maybe it was that. Maybe, the, maybe they saw light in her eyes. Maybe they saw hope. Maybe they saw joy. Maybe, maybe they saw that here's a woman who, who would slip around because of her shame or try to, try to hide her shame or pretend she wasn't ashamed. And here's a woman now who is, who is open, who has had an encounter. I don't know what it was. Here's my question for me and for you. What do people see in us when they encounter us? What do they see in us when they encounter us? In this day and time, it could be that what they see they don't understand and they might ask and say, what is it about you? What, what's, what's different about you? What, why, are, why are you different? Why aren't you like others? What, you know, always be ready to give every man an answer for the reason for the hope that you have living in you, Peter said. But here's the questions. Do people who encounter us move from skepticism to a willingness to believe the possibility because they've seen us and they've heard our report. Do they, do they move? Are they willing to investigate? Do we, do we invite people to come and see with a compellingness about it? You've got to see this. You've got to hear this. Not being pushy at all, but being convinced ourselves that we have life. We'll put it to you this way and then we're going to wrap this up. If on your way here this evening, maybe coming out the door, there was a newscast, maybe you heard it on the radio.
Maybe someone called you and said, I just heard that the water supply in Owasso and in the surrounding area has been poisoned. That if you've had contact with any water, if you drank it today, if you, if you bathe in it, if you brush your teeth with it, you have ingested a poison that will kill you within 24 hours. And we would gather here very concerned. No one knows yet of an antidote, an antitoxin. And while we were here, perhaps encouraging one another, consoling one another, praying for one another, crying out to God, someone came running in the back door and said, I have it. I have it. I have the antitoxin. It will neutralize the poison. It, this will not kill you if you drink from this and live. If you were really convinced that you had been poisoned, would you need any coaxing to drink? None of us would. Now, let's change it a little bit. A person comes in and says, you know, I've, I heard about this, this bad news we have. And, and I, th I think, I think I may have something that might help with it. I, maybe, possibly, I don't know. Might want to try it. Well, maybe some would. But there's a world of difference. When someone comes in with a compelling piece of good news, when they are convinced of it themselves. Jesus exposed his disciples to this come and see practice. And then if you, if you know how to put the Gospels together chronologically, what you're going to discover is that after this, they're not mentioned again for several weeks. There's no mention of the disciples doing a recorded visit to Jesus' hometown in John 4, verses 43 to 54, or Luke 4, 16 to 30, or Matthew 4, 13 to 16. Some have wondered and speculated, did he, did he after this point send them back to their homes? The come and see phase is over. Maybe they went home to think about things. It's to contemplate what they had, what they'd seen and heard. Maybe it was an opportunity for them to decide, am I going back to the way things were or have I heard and seen something that is so life-changing that I can never be the same again? One writer said Jesus wanted to give these men a time to allow the seeds he had planted to settle in their souls. You see, we don't need to bum rush somebody when we're talking to them about the Lord. We simply need to be absolutely convinced ourselves of what God has done in us and for us. And invite others to take a look. Because it's after this that he will once again gather these men and say, come follow. Follow me. Follow me. I want to leave you with this as we go tonight. When we're, when we're thinking about disciple making, Choose people as your method, okay? There's no method. Choose people as your method. He learned about people. I cannot say this too many times. He listened. He learned and he listened to people. And he would have us do the same because we can't read people's minds. We must listen to them and draw out of them what's on their minds. We need to help potential converts make, make solid Commitments. We need to spell out the terms of discipleship. 
You know, coming to Christ is, is simple because it's singularly focused. It's salvation by grace through faith. Following Christ is, is detailed and can be deadly. And I'm not a doomsday prophet. I, I, you know, we're we're going to win this whole thing, folks. But I believe we're heading into a time in our country where we may be raising the children that we're raising to, be, to either be martyrs or watch their parents be martyred in this country. We're going to deal with some of this next Sunday morning when we take an emphasis on a biblical family, God's, God's view of the family. Third, recognize your place in ministry and then stay there. Cultivate those gifts. Don't, don't, don't hit and miss. Don't walk away. And you all are gifted, by the way. You, that's, I wish I could somehow convince each one of you. you. You are a gifted people. God has blessed us here with gifted people. You have much more to contribute to the, to the gospel of Jesus Christ than you believe. And the devil would lie to you and tell you, no, you do not. Give those people that you call along beside you, give them a taste for ministry. You don't choke them, not feed them through a fire hose. Jesus gave them a taste and apparently sent them back home. Fifth, give disciples a vision for what they can become. Things that right now, if you know some people who would say, well, I could never... Never say never when you're talking about what, what, what's possible in Christ. That you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Now, that's not talking about getting up and jumping off a building and flying across town. But it's talking about being, becoming people that you never thought you could be. Overcoming barriers and fears and challenges that you never thought you could overcome. And then we've already brought this one up. But make it easy for them to say no. Make it easy to say no. Don't, don't coerce anybody. Don't... Make them feel like you're pressuring them. You're inviting them. Come and see. Come and follow. We're going to look at that beginning next week. Motivate people by realizing that everything we do is teaching them. We're modeling for them. Be content to let them go with you. Be content to let them see you in action. Which means you're going to have to be willing to be vulnerable, transparent, open yourself up. We've already talked about this one. Identify the spiritual enemy. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Religion that simply begins and ends with religion is an enemy to the gospel. It was in Jesus' day. Use an approach to witnessing that takes in the person you're talking with. Takes into account. Don't let them get you off on rabbit trails. Stay after the main thing. Do not allow prejudice to stand in the path of ministry. Some of the people you look at to think, never amount to anything, may be the very person that God intends to bless who will change the world around you as you know it. Don't, don't discount anybody based on what we think we see. Eleven, demonstrate that you know where you're going. That we're following Christ. We're obeying His commands. We, we love Him, therefore we're keeping His commands. Brother Norman went to a church of a friend of mine, uh, Jim Law, pastors, First Baptist Gonzales, Louisiana. He was there Wednesday, and Jim said in the course of the teaching time, Christ's last commandment should be our first concern. And we know what the last commandment was. We've looked at it several times. As you go, make disciples of all, of all the peoples. Because see, we say, well, I don't know where I'm going. We really do know where we're going. It's just that sometimes we're not sure we want to go there. Recognize, 12, the importance of timing in your ministry. You don't pick people who are not ripe. You wait, you're patient. And then when they are, when they are moving, when they are hungry, when, then you feed them and you lead them and, and you care for them and you nurture them. Otherwise, you, you sit patiently and wait. And if they just outright reject you, then you love them and you walk away. Life's too short to try to 
drag somebody along, kicking and screaming. 13, challenge your disciples to share in your vision. Ask them what they think about it. In our context, what, do you, what, do you, what, what comes to you when you think, follow Christ, love God, love others, and serve the world? What, what kind of images come to your mind? What thoughts come to your mind? What, what, what passages of Scripture do you attach that to? What faces of people come on the horizon for you? And then as I said, give them time to make a solid commitment. <sighs> remember, I hear, I forget. I see, I remember. I do, I understand. Now we have got to be about the doing. We've got to put aside the stuff that the disciples were pretty wrapped up with. Jesus didn't fit their mold. And guess what, folks? If we'll, if we'll just honestly assess the situation, he doesn't fit our mold either. He doesn't fit anybody's mold because, you see, Jesus came not to be molded, but to mold people into his image. And then think about it. I don't know. Do you know any Samaritan women? Any people nobody else likes? Any people who've given up? They're hopeless. They nobody has any confidence in them. Nobody cares for them. Jesus had to go to Samaria, not because that was the most convenient route. And I think I asked myself, what is it you have to, that you have to do? That I, cannot, I cannot but do this. I have to. I have to go there. I have to. I'm compelled to. And she sensed his compel compelledness because she too was compelled and became compelling. Let's talk a few minutes before we go. It's a little late, I realize, but just hang with me here. Hang with me.